Sup Freaks, this rip was brought to you by our good friends at River. River has a new referral program. Go to river.com slash TFTC for $5 worth of Bitcoin. When you sign up, set up an account and buy $100, you're going to get $5 of Bitcoin on top of that. River is the most secure Bitcoin exchange since they don't rely on any third parties. They built everything in-house from their wallets to their Lightning Network wallets. They also have zero fee, dollar cost averaging. Other platforms charge large fees and have giant spreads. Go with River to avoid that. If you set up your DCA, again, you're not going to pay any fees on those buys. River also has a relationship management team that's US-based and available by phone for you or your business. You can actually call River to get some customer support. It's a great value add that is hard to find these days. And again, they build everything in-house, including their cold storage. And all Bitcoin is held one-to-one in their multi-sig cold storage wallets but they encourage self-custody as Bitcoiners. So the goal is to get you Bitcoin and to get it off of River into a wallet that you control. They build everything in-house. It's the most secure exchange. They've got free dollar cost averaging and they have the new referral program. So go to river.com slash TFTC, sign up and you'll get $5 worth of Bitcoin after you buy $100. Enjoy this rip. Whitney, it's great to have you back. It's been a long, Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm sorry. Uh, well, it was winter for me because I live in Chile, right? So um, I guess, you know, I didn't have to worry about making a wood fire every day. I guess that was probably like the only benefit of uh, not being in my house for three months. <laughs> but yeah, great to be back. It feels uh, nice to be doing an interview again after a long, uh, not really necessarily sought out hiatus. Yeah. And you're ending that hiatus with World War Three fuckery starting. It's pretty insane out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, so much stuff has happened over the past three months. It's like been pretty mind boggling um, to watch and also kind of desensitizing because I mean, you know, I mean, as we've talked about before, clown world has not uh, gone away and has only gotten like more clownish and there's no exit ramps. And it's just like, instead, you we're all descending deeper into the madness. I don't know. Headlines are always crazy and uh, it's obviously not getting any crazy, uh, any less crazy. It's just getting crazier. So um, I have a feeling that trend will continue uh, a lot. Actually, I think next year is going to be fucking wild. 2024, also an election year. And uh, you know, uh a lot of weird stuff has been predicted for next year like um economic calamity uh the cyber 911 stuff like that so we'll see what happens but uh i definitely think next year is going to be really spicy yeah i mean the stage is certainly being set we have shit popping off in israel and palestine i've intentionally mm-hmm. try to stay away from it because the fog of war is never a good time like as it's going on to to be making rash takes hot takes and it's just been insane to see sure. the vitriol i mean if you're looking for something to divide people something popping off between yeah. israel and palestine is definitely that yeah most definitely well so if you so i've been reporting on israel and palestine like for a really long time Uh, A lot of my early journalistic career was pretty much like in that space, almost not exclusively, but predominantly. Um, The U.S. population in particular is like primed to have that be probably one of the most polarizing issues, uh, period, you know, and it's very much along the existing like left right divide, but not necessarily, you know, Um, but it's uh it's a lot of it is also like baked into the religious landscape of the united states uh you know through christian zionism and a lot of other stuff and uh, i don't know i've done a lot on the history of zionism and um a lot about um some of the messianic movements both like in israel and in the u.s that see um a lot of what's happening happening now oddly enough as necessary for the fulfillment of end times prophecy Um, And some of those groups have like a very direct and openly stated posture that they should do absolutely everything uh, that they possibly can to hasten the coming of the end times. So that's definitely, you know, 
I guess maybe some people view that as conspiratorial thinking and, and looking at this current conflict. But I mean, if you think about it and you have these like world leaders, both in Israel and the U.S. and elsewhere, thinking that certain things need to happen for religious motivations that they care deeply about, those are probably going to shape geolo- geopolitical events specifically in this area to a very significant degree. And it's been going on for many years, if not really centuries. And um, I don't know, I mean, I can get more in the weeds uh, about that if you want, because I think honestly, one of the big issues as it comes to people understanding this particular conflict is that um, not a lot of people have really dug that deeply into the history of Zionism at all. And like a lot of people I I talked to in the States, like when I lived there, didn't even realize that Israel's creation as a state happened as recently as 1948. Like there's old people that think it's always been there and don't really get the conflict at all, you know? So I think, you know, that um, really makes it easy to, you know, for certain quote unquote influencers in in different spaces to shape narratives that aren't necessarily uh, accurate. But, um, you know, if you dig deeper into the history of Zionism and also into some of these more like messianic focused movements that are very intertwined with the political landscape of both the U.S. and Israel, that's probably like the best way to predict how this is going to play out yeah. over the next uh, couple months and years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With the biblical tilt, you have the Christians like Mike Pence here in the U S who want that temple to be brought down and then rebuilt, which will. Oh, it's not just Pence though. It's, uh, uh, it's the, yeah, it's the Christian Zionists are very big on the destruction of the dome of the rock or the Al-Aqsa mosque uh, for the purpose of the rebuilding of the third temple, which is also huge, uh, with a lot of, um, I guess segments of his, Israeli society that are in power right now with the current Netanyahu led uh, coalition, some of these um, more like extremist settler groups, um, very into uh, the destruction of that existing structure. And this is all about like end time stuff, but it's also not just them. Like if you're a, a subscriber to um, the influence of secret societies, for example, um, you know, Freemasons, totally obsessed with the third temple also. So there's like all these different uh, groups of varying influence that are very interested in seeing something happen there and see it as a prerequisite to their differing, you know, but overlapping, you know, in time theories uh, coming to fruition. So um, for people that don't know, Al-Aqsa Mosque is, I believe, one. I think it's the third holiest site in Islam. So if anything happens to that building, you're going to have the entire Muslim world uh, coming after the people who were responsible. Yeah. And uh, some of the current people in Israel's government um, or factions that are now quite heavily represented in their legislature and in, in the current administration uh, were people that like back in the 1980s were trying to tunnel under the Dome of the Rock to blow it up. And were considered, you know, very fringe extremists at that time, but now they're not. Like now they're in power. And there's a very, um, you know, it's there's a lot of risk there for sure of having something happen to that building. And it, it'll probably be, you know, I, I don't really look forward to that happening, but it seems almost inevitable just because so many people think it has to happen for their different, you know, eschatological you know, beliefs to, to come out. And I don't know. I mean, it's just so crazy to talk about because this is like such a level of, um, I guess, uh, reality that a lot of people don't think about that. Like, you know, uh, people think, Oh, this is confirmation of, uh, you know, what I was taught as a kid in church or whatever. Like, I think that's how they want people to feel. Uh, because these people have also very openly stated they're intentionally doing it because they don't want to wait for God to do it. They have to do it. Like that's the theological justification, both on the Christian and Jewish side to make this happen. I mean, all very, very nuts. So it's basically like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense, but it's going to lead to a lot of uh, death and destruction and complete madness. 
And, um, you know, I mean, the deeper you go into like this whole like messianic stuff, like the, the Jewish Messiah and the Mashiach and all that stuff, um, and what that's supposed to mean in both the Christian and Jewish sense, and this idea of like, you know, new world order sort of springing from that. Um, yeah, I mean, it gets, it gets pretty nuts when you consider the possibilities of where this could uh, go, if these people in the driver's seat trying to, you know, have a particular vision, they're trying to fulfill, how successful will they be in fulfilling that vision? I don't know. It's worth uh, doing some research into what they believe and what they think needs to happen. So one of the things, you know, they think needs to happen is the complete expulsion of all Palestine, of all Palestinians from the state of Israel, uh, you know, uh, from the occupied territories in Gaza and also, you know, Israel, uh, you know, itself where there's like, you know, uh, Palestinian citizens that are Israeli citizens, but they're, of, you know, they're Palestinian. So basically the idea that they all need to be ethnically cleansed, essentially, uh, from the area. And this is like really prominent in Christian Zionism. And, you know, like you mentioned, Mike Pence, there's a lot of other really powerful people uh, that subscribe to that. And it's, it's very uh, prominent, particularly in the Republican Party. But I mean, one of the main organizations directing a lot of this um, within the United States is called Kufi, Christians United for Israel. And uh, Netanyahu has described Kufi as essential to Israel's national security. And there's a lot of overlap uh, between the two. So definitely um, worth exploring that stuff. And I actually did a really in-depth piece about all of this stuff that's uh, well-sourced and probably one of the best articles I've uh, written on the subject called The Untold History of Christian Zionism. You can find it um, on Mint Press News, where I used to write. Um, I, it was part of a longer series, but I stopped because uh, the Epstein thing happened and my whole career kind of changed after that. But managed to get this out before all that happened. Definitely worth taking the time to look at it, in my opinion. Yeah. Because this is going to be a really crazy... Uh, series of events in yeah, the Middle East for sure. It's very scary. The vitriol is at an all-time high. You have both sides calling for genocide uh, in in that part of the world. And it's baffling. I, I've seen you been tweeting about it and I've just been observing. Again, I've been trying to be very intentional and not have any hot takes on the subject because if I'm being completely honest, I'd again, fog of war, things mm -hmm. are going on in real time and I honestly don't know what's happening, what intentions are, or what any ulterior motives may be. But the one observation I have made is that it's just stunning that everybody's been riled up so successfully, and this is coming off the heels of the COVID, lockdowns, the vaccine mandates, yeah. the war in Ukraine. And it's like, if you're a puppet master, if you were to envision a puppet master, it's like you get uh, the COVID lockdowns, you get everybody scared, you get the war in Ukraine, you get everybody on the left supporting that, and then you get this war where you get the neocons supporting what's going on in Israel and Palestine right now. Of course. And everybody gets what they want. Well, the whole thing about neoconservatives, like from their origins, from a political standpoint, have consistently been about um, basically unifying American foreign policy and Israeli foreign policy, like tooling U.S. foreign policy to benefit Israeli foreign policy. So hence the war in Iraq and a lot of other stuff. And this goes back to like policy documents written by uh, very important pe figures in that movement, like Richard Pearl, his um, a clean break uh, in the late 90s calling for the removal of Saddam Hussein. And um, I mean, even people like Hillary Clinton, who people don't think of as necessarily a neoconservative, but sort of very much fulfilling of that pro-war uh, line. Also in you know leaked emails talked about a starting... Uh, fomenting the quote unquote Syrian revolution and all of the, you know, the proxy war stuff that happened there as a way to benefit Israel explicitly and stuff like that. And it's, you know, there's differing opinions, of course, as to why that is, if whether it's uh, over due to undue influence of Israel over the United States or the U.S. seeing Israel as a useful tool to keep the Middle East perpetually uh, unstable. And of course, Britain uh, also being in, in that mix, uh, seeing that as favorable as well. Um, but again, you know, this is all uh, really complicated stuff. And I think what you mentioned earlier about this coming on the heels of COVID and people being really riled up. So every time 
uh, people get really riled up over something, the people that are trying to hurt us into insane digital enslavement land, um, use that to their benefit, right? And it, it essentially becomes another um, you know, opportunity to deploy divide and conquer tactics, of course, for their benefit and not for ours. So um, there was a take that I thought was kind of interesting. And obviously, I'm going to paraphrase here. And it, um, I think it was Gareth Ike that said it. But something like, you know, in any situation, well, not necessarily any situation, but I guess this situation, you know, people are really being pushed uh, to pick a side, you know, are you with Hamas or are you with the IDF? But what we should really do is pick the side of all the, you know, the innocent civilians who aren't part of these freaking banker wars. And we should just step off the chessboard and stop playing their game. And I think that's, um, you know, uh, a pretty good take, honestly, um, because, you know, obviously, um, I mean, I haven't been following what ha what's happened here super closely, but as far as I understand it, you know, the first uh, bloodshed was this rave in southern Israel. <clears throat> and apparently that was for the purpose of, you know, uh, promoting like peace with the Palestinians. So like a lot of the people that were killed there were Israelis that, for example, had chosen not to serve in the IDF and things like that. You know, people that Palestinians, I think, would normally see as allies within Israel. But then you have people's, you know, sort of glorifying that on one side. And then, of course, on the other side, Gaza, um, half of the population of Gaza are children, you know, under the age of 18. And so promoting the carpet bombing of, of that, uh, the uh, refusal uh, to let humanitarian aid in, uh, bombing people who are evacuating per IDF instructions and all of this stuff. I mean, there's no celebrating that. And there's this whole return of this mentality of you're either with us or you're with the terrorist stuff. You know, just like, you know, the um, post 9-11 mentality which is the same mentality a lot of these same people were criticizing from the left during the COVID era, you know, it's, it's come back and I think unfortunately shows that a lot of people are still very much caught in that, that trap and pretty easily manipulated, um, you know, by the, the, by the powers that be. And it's not, again, you know, benefiting any of the regular people here, whether it's in Israel, Palestine, or, or somewhere else, you know, there's just a lot of... Um, you know, innocent people that don't want any of this. And I would also encourage people to keep in mind that um, Israel and also, you know, Hamas and the Gaza Strip, like forced the COVID vaccine on the populations that they rule over. So, you know, that's also something to keep in mind. And there's a lot of uh, documentation that's come out, you know, over the years uh, preceding this current conflict of how Israel uh, wanted Hamas to be in control of the Gaza Strip because they could um, treat it as a hostile entity and not have to, you know, deal with the peace process, which, you know, if you're familiar with um, a lot of, you know, at least the national level is really, you know, how politics works there. Uh, there's been a consistent effort to sabotage any sort of two-state solution uh, for a really uh, long time. And of course, you know, the fact that those forces in Israel would want Hamas to be in power in the Gaza Strip suggests that Hamas is not the group that is going to act in the best interests of Palestinians or Palestinian sovereignty, right? So um, I don't know. Those are just some things I'd like to say, I guess, about the conflict. But again, you know, uh, the loss of human life is always going to be lamentable there. But I have a feeling that the pot is only going to continually uh, be stirred because, you know, a lot of these same groups that, you know, I, I brought up earlier that have this whole uh, messianic flavor to everything they do think that we, you know, there needs to be a big war between Israel and Iran uh, for the end times and that the, the Dome of the Rock's got to get blown up and all the Palestinians have to be removed from Israel and all these different things have to happen. And uh, you have people with major influence over major governments in this whole conflict, whether directly involved right now or in the periphery or soon to be involved, you know, who feel that way. Crazy. Yeah. No, it's completely insane. It's extremely disheartening again, to see the vitriol and just the animalistic reaction to this, where it's like us versus them. And like you mentioned, half the population of Gaza, 1.1 million of the 2.2 are under the age of 18. And a lot of people have been like, oh, they're, they're all pro Hamas. They voted them in, but it's like 
half the population is not a voting age. So that doesn't really make sense. Then you have the whole like attack on this rave and then getting through the borders, which was really perplexing considering uh, how tightly secured those borders have been historically. Most definitely. Yeah. And the, the, the comparisons from Israel's government saying that this was Israel's 9-11. Hmm. And very odd when you like are aware of the extensiveness of Israel's, you know, surveillance capabilities domestically as well as internationally. I mean, it's just absurd that they wouldn't have been able to know that was going to happen in advance. And there's people that are like, you know, uh, IDF veterans and Israelis that definitely are no friends of, you know, Palestine or Hamas that are saying that's the case. And, um, you know, if you're familiar with the realities of 9-11, um, there's only really a few possibilities there. Either it was intentionally done by, you know, intelligence agencies or it was allowed to happen by intelligence agencies. So I think we can assume that, um, you know, similar possibilities may have happened here with, with Israel because, you know, before all of this happened, Netanyahu was facing like major issues domestically, a huge amount of protests against him, major efforts to remove him from power. Um, it, he, um, he's been trying to stay in power because the justice system, this particular attorney has been going after him for corruption for some time. And so he teamed up with sort of these far, uh, sort of like extremist groups, I guess, that, that we touched on earlier as sort of a way, like, I'll help you guys get into power if you help me pass this judicial reform legislation that will, if it does pass, essentially allow Netanyahu to get off the hook uh, for the charges he's facing. And, um, yeah, so, so that if it conveniently all goes away, and now there's a new unity government uh, that's justified by the war and uh, oddly, um, uh, well, not oddly, but tellingly, um, the, you know, polls from within Israel, most Israelis for everything going on right now blame Netanyahu and want him to resign. Yeah, so. it's very convenient. And again, it's the hearkening to 9-11 is mind blowing. Like going just pattern recognition. I was 10, 11 when 9-11 happened and witnessed everything that happened, got as a fourth grader yeah. got pulled into the the war drum beating. Like they riled us up at our elementary school. Like we got to go to war, we got to go to war. And I just, I, it was on my computer because I wanted to pull up this tweet. Uh, here's the original tweet. Nobody said on 9-11, America must retaliate proportionally. Uh, both sides need to show restraint. Where's the proof of all the dead bodies? You were oversimplifying. There's context about the conflict you're ignoring. Let's try to de-escalate the situation. And so this is somebody from the Israel side saying, like, no, like we we didn't question this during nine eleven. Like we shouldn't have to question it now. Then Thomas Woods, Tom Woods, uh, quote tweet that said, if only we had spoken and thought like this instead of pointlessly pulling trillions of dollars and killing at least four point five million people, uh, according to the Washington Post. What we laughingly call the conservative movement is a disgrace. So it's just like it feels like what happened after 9-11 is happening again and knowing the aftermath of 9-11 and how fucked up it was we lied to get into the wars weapons of mass destruction didn't exist like nobody ever questions the saudi involvement like who was actually driving the planes flying the planes and the patriot act that came after it and led to the dystopian hellscape that we're currently living in and it's just mind-boggling that people can't see the the pattern recognition like it's the same playbook over again in my mind obviously fog of war things are happening people are dying mm -hmm. by the hundreds day in and day out and people are really riled up and unable to see clearly what's going on but sitting at my desk here in austin texas and observing this from afar it seems pretty obvious that the playbook is being run back yeah and you know what's actually pretty disturbing to me uh, I've talked about this with a couple people that I've worked with in the past, like um, Robbie Martin and Jeremy Lafredo. Um, I, I've had some concerns for a while that some of the people that became prominent um, as sort of dissidents in the COVID-19 era uh, became very cozy or were directly tied to the neoconservatives who came 
to prominence during the Bush era. Um, and we're sort of, in my opinion, trying to bring a lot of, you know, so think about the MAGA base, right? And how sort of Trump became popular. Well, Trump, when he was campaigning in 2015, was very much like took an anti-neocon posture, right? Mm -hmm. And not necessarily anti-war, but definitely, you know, less uh, Iraq was a mistake, for example, in, in saying things of of that nature. And that was very popular. And really among, you know, the Republican voting base, there was a mass rejection of neocon foreign policy. Um, and that seems to have changed, isn't it? And it seems like there's been a lot of uh, figures that have sort of regained uh, the trust of that particular base uh, during the COVID era and are now currently uh, saying we need to go uh, to war and bomb the crap out of uh, Gaza and maybe Iran and maybe Lebanon. Well, the whole Iran so, thing. Something to think about. Like the Lindsey Grahams of the world and Nikki Haley's coming out and being like, we need to go attack Iran. It's like, whoa, like they're. I don't know how people still vote for Lindsey Graham. That guy is insane. He goes on TV and says the most like insane like war pro. I just I don't know. I don't know how people believe that and like look at that guy and are like, that's who I want to vote vote for. Unless they're like, you know, they work for defense contractors or they just have like mush brain. You know, I just don't get it. No. Yeah, he's 70 year old, 70 years old, no children, just wants to bomb the crap of the world then die and just leave us with the mess. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yikes. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, there's some websites. So, so some of these neocon guys like Frank Gaffney, people that were tied up with PNAC, if you're familiar, Project for a New American Century, and it's, uh, I guess, follow-up organization, the Foreign Policy Initiative. A lot of those people uh, got involved with the Stop Vaccine Passport stuff. And even made a website, I think it was called like stopvaccinepassports.com or something, and um, got very like involved with those efforts with COVID. And there's a you know a lot of uh, you know like a lot of them ended up popping up, like Frank Gaffney in particular on Steve Bannon's War Room pandemic War Room stuff, right? Um, and sort of rehabilitating some neocon foreign policy, but being like, oh, we're against globalism and digital IDs and the vaccine passport, you know, saying all this stuff that sort of brings that base back. And then when the time is right and the trust is, is there, they're like, and war with Iran, which is exactly where the Bush era neocons were going, like after Iraq anyway. Yeah. I mean, before, I don't know. before he died. This seems overly convenient to me. So again, this is why I uh, like to tell people don't have political saviors and please think for yourself because if you just, you know, outsource your brain, okay, you're not outsourcing your brain to MSM anymore, but you're outsourcing your brain to Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson (laughs) and, um, you know, Steve Bannon and people like that. You're not necessarily going to get led in a better direction than MSM would eventually lead you. Yeah, you got to think for yourself. Not you at gotta, this point. And you, you have to slay your heroes if they start leading you astray. And it's very obvious that it's happening right now. It's, and again, it, it, going back to the convenience of the timing of it all, whether it's the sort of political morass that Netanyahu felt, found himself in a few months ago or here in the U.S., we have a financial crisis that's on the verge of, of popping off. I'm not sure if you've been paying attention to what's going on there, but it's pretty obvious. Yeah, that something sure. is structurally but war broken. helps, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's all very convenient. Mm-hmm. Just similar to COVID in 2019, the fall of 2019, it was becoming right. glaringly obvious that the financial system was systemically fragile. And it's becoming glaringly obvious that we're back at that point again in the fall of 2023. And like you said, war. Right. Um, helps well war traditionally lets the fed print lots and lots of money because it's war we got to do it we got to win the war right so um i think we we can guess um what'll happen there unfortunately not gonna get much better but i i do want to sort of uh circle back for well bring up, I guess, some some research I've done uh, in the past and was sort of the subject of uh, what I talked about at the Bitcoin conference um, in May. So 
there's like this particular group. It's a public private partnership. It's housed within the World Economic Forum, the WEF. But the main, um, I guess, groups that compose this partnership are uh, the FBI and the DOJ and the Secret Service, Israel's uh, secure, one of their security agencies and the UK National Crime Agency, and then a bunch of banks, right? And then a few tech companies here and there. I think uh, Palantir, maybe it's PayPal, Microsoft. I mean, some of these big guys are there. And basically, uh, they're led by a former uh, Israeli spy named Tal Goldstein that used to uh, develop a lot of really crazy policies for Netanyahu. And uh, Jeremy Jurgens, who I guess is number two at the WEF after Klaus Schwab at the big WEF meeting earlier this year, was like, yep, big giant cyber attack before 2025. And, you know, the part of the WEF, WEF PAC, the Partnership Against Cybercrime, that's the DOJ and, and all of these guys uh, say that it's going to be a cyber attack on the banks. Hmm. Mm. Isn't that convenient that like the banks can just be like, oh, well, we've collapsed, but it wasn't our fault. It was the fault of these nasty hackers. And I'm sure the hackers will be Hamas and Iran, <laughs> you know, uh, they can blame anyone. Because as we know from uh, Vault 7 and WikiLeaks, right? Um, the CIA has the ability to frame literally any government it wants or any group it wants for a cyber attack. And the CIA lost control of those tools, hence uh, WikiLeaks obtaining them and publishing them. And, uh, you know, anyone can do it. Anyone can blame anyone. So it's very difficult to attribute. And even if you look at um, headlines about cyber attacks that have happened over the past several years, it's usually a cybersecurity company that, if you look on its website, was created by NQTEL, the CIA, or it was created by Israel's Unit 8200, which is Israel's like NSA equivalent. And they're saying stuff like, high probability that it might have been these guys, and uh, our proof is that we don't have any proof, but it looks like something they might have done before. We think they did before. I mean, it's just like there's no evidence for anything. But out of you know that googly guck, you get a headline that says Chinese hackers responsible, you mm -hmm. know, or you know Iranian hackers responsible, and that's all people see and read, right? Yeah, and it's I mean it's mm -hmm. very easy to see that we could be in chapter one of the systemic bank failure, where it starts with this conflict in the Middle East. It keeps rising yeah. and then there's an excuse to begin at cyber attacking perceived enemies. And that's how the yeah. banks get attacked. So there's this whole there's this whole group of the big banks that's very secretive and it's affiliated with WEFPAC and they have been gaming this out since like 2021 or so. It's a FS ISAC, the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Yeah, and, and they collaborated with uh, the European Central Bank, the Fed, the Carnegie Endowment that at the time was run by the current CIA director, William Burns, um, talking about exactly how this was going to play out, the cyber attack on the banks. Yeah, and I know I sent yeah. you this information probably a couple months at this, at this point, but in parallel to all this going on, the Bank of International Settlements has been running CBDC trials with partner central banks yep. around the world. So they're, maybe they're doing that in parallel. A cyber attacks happen and it's like, oh, thank totally. God we've been running this. But, but I think they're going to do it a couple different ways to try and uh, keep populations uh, from rebelling against it in certain countries where there's a growing awareness about CBDCs. So I think it's pretty clear that direct issue CBDCs, like as the, the BIS has laid out, are going to or have already happened in basically BRICS countries. So Brazil, Russia, China, uh, it's all pretty much set up to play out that way, just as the BIS has uh, foretold. But I think in some of these countries where the population is more uh, wary of CBDCs or obvious centralized control of CBDCs, they're going to uh, try and keep the two tier system, you know, as it exists like right now in the US, and basically have the CBDC 
exist, but the public doesn't necessarily interact with it, which is, you know, essentially what FedNow is going to be, right? Um, it's about settlements like between banks and they'll use the CBDC and then they'll, uh, the public will interact instead with deposit tokens. And that'll be issued by uh, the commercial banks and that's what the public will interact with. And they're not called CBDCs, but they're programmable money and they're gonna run on the rails of FedNow. And it's really not that different of a system, but they can, you know, oh, I have my JP Morgan deposit tokens and I have my Citibank deposit tokens and I have my Wells Fargo deposit tokens and it's not a CBDC, right? It's uh, it's an abstracted so think, uh, white label CBDC, if you will. Yeah, well, if you look at the big banks in the U.S., they're all in on deposit tokens and tokenized assets. J.P. Morgan, all in, and they're you know the banks that who are the banks that run the Fed, right? So I mean, the most powerful Fed bank is the the one in New York, right? And the main you know shareholders of that bank, it's City and. JP Morgan. And the head of JP Morgan, of course, is Jamie Dimon. And the person who essentially created Citibank, Jamie Dimon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's basically the same crowd uh, that decides what goes on there. And uh, I mean, if you've been looking at what Jamie Dimon has been saying uh, recently, you know, about stuff like we should seize private, private property for the purpose of combating climate change you want these banks to be able to issue you programmable money like it doesn't have to be a cbdc issued by the fed to like have the same consequences you know what i mean no i mean you could argue the way the financial system set up now like it, it practically already exists like they can just unperson anybody yeah and totally for any reason. they have yeah it happened to what Merkola. And uh, in his banks, they got deplatformed from Chase without any warning. Yeah, I mean, obviously we had Russell Brand didn't get debanked, but we got kicked off of YouTube. We had Nigel Farage in the UK had his bank accounts ripped out from under him. It's totally possible right now. It's just um, not as popular, I guess. A CBDC like. Um, system would make it easier, but I think it's totally possible today. It's just not politically palatable for most people. Right. Well, I mean, I think in the U.S. again, it's they're going to try and set it up a different way than they're they're like running it in China and Russia and some of these BRICS countries, which are much more, you know, the multipolar world order. You know, that crowd or whatever are a lot of them seem to be favoring the direct issue CBDC. But you know, you've already had like you know, some statements from the Fed about like a wariness toward a CBDC that some people have sort of taken as proof, uh, as proof for some mystical, like, trust the Fed Q, a QAnon equivalent thing that Jerome Powell and Jamie Dimon <laughs> are like, actually our friends. Um, and like, no, I think that just means that they know that a lot of people in the US would resist a CBDC direct issued, uh, you know, a push for that system. And so, so they're going to create essentially the same system in a way that seems a little more palatable or at least not as obvious or at least more analogous to the current system. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a theory out there. It's being popularized by Tom Luongo. I like I've had on this show, but he's convinced that the Fed uh, via their interest rate policy and being directed by the big banks here in the U.S. is essentially attacking the Davos class by trying to collapse the European banking system um, by draining the euro dollar yeah. system with this high interest rate regime. Yeah, I'm I'm familiar, and he apparently doesn't like what I have to say about this. I've been told, but um, rule number one for me is never trust the bankers and never trust the Fed, <laughs> and I'm going to stick by that. That's a good rule because uh, it's worked really well for me so far. So, um, you know, I don't think Jamie Dimon and the and Jerome Powell play 3D and 5D chess. I don't. Um, I think, you know, essentially the world as it is now, I think it's a lot more run by transnational capital than a lot of people would like to think, you know? And I think that's why you end up seeing commonalities, for example, with COVID. You know, why is uh, why did the U.S. go all in for a lot of the same COVID policies and draconian uh, 
you know, lockdowns and restrictions of civil liberties that happened in Russia and China in the entire world. Obviously, there's a lot more that the elite agree on than they disagree on when it comes to, uh, you know, keeping their respective populations under the boot. Right. Yeah. And and why do they all seem to get together at these globalist um, groups like Davos and what have you, you know, Jackson Hole, Bilderberg. But yeah, no, it's, right. it's, it seems like if the end goal is to confuse and instill fear in the global population to cattle herd them into this system, like it's mm-hmm. it's happening in real time. So you can believe that the Fed and the commercial banks here in the U.S. are attacking Europe and use that as like a diversion tactic to be like, no, they're on our side and just get everybody placated and um, sort of believing that that's the truth. And then at the end of the day, they are all just like, ha ha, we yeah. paid you. Trust the plan is now trust the Fed. Um, I'm <laughs> not a believer. Sorry. Um, yeah, but I, I do want <clears throat> to point out that, you know, we are really in unprecedented times and there's obviously going to be a lot of big shifts and they're probably going to happen in the next one to two years. So that cyber attack we were talking about earlier, once that happens, uh, they're going to push for, and they've already mapped it out, the end of both online and financial anonymity. So if you're you know, talking about CBDCs or any sort of CBDC equivalent system, you know, essentially you know, KYC, right? <laughs> That's all gonna be forced on everybody for everything. And anything that doesn't have that or affords any sort of financial privacy or anonymity will be made illegal under national security justifications. So we can expect a cyber Patriot Act to come after this event. Yeah, that's gonna have that stuff in it because they've already mapped out the policy. And then of course the end of online anonymity means tying a government issued ID uh, to your internet access and having internet access, you know, require that at the ISP level. And that's what they've mapped out to do. It's extremely so, terrifying. The internet as you know it now will not exist after this happens, right? And you'll, th- you know, what they'll say is, oh, you want to be allowed to be back online. You know, you have to get this ID, which of course is going to be some sort of digital ID equivalent, you know, since they're pushing for all of this with the CBDCs at the same time, right? But the goal is no anonymity period and to have everything you do surveilled and compiled and, uh, you know, have AI oversee it all and do all this predictive policing, uh, pre-crime stuff based on what you've already done and what you will do. So essentially the most important thing to do is not to participate in the system after that event. Just don't do it. So I would say if you want some of the stuff that's like on the internet now in terms of like knowledge, back that up offline download it, put it on hard drives, Faraday bag it, keep it, you know, safe. Because if you might want that stuff after all this happens and you don't want to have to, you know, get the cattle tag to be able to be online, you know, you definitely think ahead because if you want to believe what the WEF says about this timeline on this stuff, which is, I would take them seriously. Um, you know, you've got like a year, give or take a few months before the internet gets, uh, you know, nuked, basically. Completely cucked. Now Mm -hmm. that you mentioned that, like the timeline of everything, like going all the way back to COVID, Ukraine, Russia, and then this time last year, you had the emergence of what many people would describe as the first consumer-ready AI applications. Then you have this pop-off in the Middle East, the banking crisis happening in parallel. Like everything is just lining up almost too perfectly. Yeah, there's there's a lot lining up and it's 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 not good. But the good thing is that, you know, the more you look at the stuff, the more you can think about solutions. Right. So <clears throat> definitely want to talk about that in a second. I'm going to drink some water really quick so I don't cough everywhere. Sorry. I've been kind of sick for a week or two. Um, yeah. So. A lot of crazy stuff going on right now is happening thanks to, or at least it's being enabled by in a huge way by big tech. So I'll, I'll give some examples um, before we talk about like AI in, in general, because I'm writing a piece on that that I think is pretty important. But Microsoft, you know, 
over the last three months. I forget exactly when because I've sort of uh, been in an offline bubble a lot of the time with my with my son. But um, they essentially came out and said, like, all right, you use a Microsoft, you know, Windows machine. Um, your data is not your data anymore. And we can, we're going to take your data whenever we want off the machine and train our AI on it. And you can't opt out. And if we decide to, we can just delete your data or block you from accessing your device by blocking your Microsoft ID or whatever. So if you're using a Windows machine, your data is not your data. And if you're serious about fighting this stuff, you have no excuse to not invest in some sort of freedom tech stuff. So I definitely think people, particularly like in the Bitcoin space, uh, need to put a lot more attention considering what we're facing on freedom tech and supporting developers that are uh, developing that tech. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're sure. aware of the project, but uh, Start OS is basically a Linux based system that's trying to create a new operating system external to Microsoft and Apple that people can can use and use open source software products to to run their their lives so use something like Nextcloud instead of Dropbox and um, have Jitsi instead of Zoom right yeah well I think you know I, I think even Jitsi like got rid of their anonymity function recently too like really? a lot of these are under yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, there's a huge need for to divest from big tech as much as possible. And it needs to happen quickly because unless you, you know, the choice is either participate in the system being designed for you by the crazy people and become a slave or don't become a slave. Right. So if you don't want to be a slave, you have to invest now in making in, in big tech alternatives unless you want to live a completely analog life. Right. Yeah. And so yep. if you don't think it's practical for you to live an analog life, you got to find something that works. That isn't these guys. Yeah. And it's, it's not easy. It's hard. Like running start OS, getting uh, a, a private public key pair set up on Noster and interacting with those different clients is definitely harder. It's more rough around the edges, but it's getting better. And if you shift the development talent, particularly to focus on these areas, I think you can reach parity with big tech in terms of being able to do on your computer and interact on social networks yeah, like totally. you do in the incumbent system. Well, here's the thing. People, people are lazy and like, don't want to have to learn how to do something new or something that like maybe has two steps more than what they used before. I mean, people have to get over that. You know, it's not going to be the easiest route is to go the slavery route. And that's how they've designed it on purpose. The whole selling point of that system is that it's convenient and easy. So obviously it's going to take some work uh, to go the other route. But uh, yeah, I mean, the future of human freedom depends on it. So I think it's a pretty easy choice. And if you have to do some, you know, tutorials or whatever, why the Internet is still like sort of functioning the way it, it, it should function to an extent in terms of like democratizing access to information, like let's please do that. And not be like, oh, man, I wish I did that now that they've, uh, you know, screwed the whole Internet over and I have to get a digital ID if I want to be online anymore. You know, yeah. like now is the time. Now is the time. And not enough people are, are talking about it or are focused on solutions. And I think, you know, that's one of the major problems in independent media right now, just in general is that it's all um, about clicks and who's going to watch my stuff and talking about stuff that's going to keep my audience like sucked in, I guess, and not necessarily so much about like, how do we get out of this? And if you want to think that this timeline or, you know, if it seems to you like it does to me that the timeline for action is getting increasingly small, we got to start doing stuff and we got to start talking about how to do that that stuff. And if you don't have like the developing, you know, the programming know-how or whatever, there are people that do, right? And you can support them or you can learn. Yeah. And divest somehow. I mean, for people that don't want to do that too, you know, there's um there's options like uh Ramiro Romani runs a above phone and they make de-googled smartphones ready to go. 
super easy. You can buy it from his website. They're making laptops now for people that don't want to have to invest the time and like putting graphing OS on a phone themselves or, you know, learning, you know, all this, you know, learning a Linux necessarily, like they make it really easy. And, and, and there's, you know, there's never been a better time to do that than now, because, you know, if you see where Microsoft's going, you're not going to be able to keep access to your own data unless, you know, you avoid committing thought crime yeah. for Microsoft. I mean, that's just nuts. No, and to continue mapping this out for people, like going back to Start OS, it's created by a company called Start Nine Labs, and they're essentially creating an operating system that will allow you to self host all of your stuff. So you'll have a server at your house. They partner with Purism um, to get their operating system out of the box. You can buy one of the Purism laptops if you want to. You can buy a Purism server, plug it in, and then it's plug and play. You get the D Google. The Apple, the Microsoft software suite, and then you can host all of your data on your own machine, your pictures, your files. You don't have to send it to the cloud and feed the AI superstructure that's trying to take your life over. Man, and the AI stuff is legit insane. So um, Catherine Austin Fitz, who runs the Solari Report, um, and is awesome in general, and has done a lot of great interviews about CBDCs and the BIS and all of that, um, asked me to write a piece for uh, their new issue on artificial intelligence. And so I decided to write about something I've wanted to do for a while, though it's kind of torturous, which is uh, to read uh, the book on AI written by Henry Kissinger and former <laughs> Google CEO Eric Schmidt. And, you know, I wasn't really surprised for what I found. It's fucking nuts. Um, and so my piece for them is titled The Final Coup uh, because I think that's really what it is. So, you know, Henry Kissinger, what has his whole career be been really? So he ran the State Department and he was like, you know, an operator for groups like the Trilateral Commission and a lot of these other entities that want like global technocracy as sort of designed by groups like the Rockefellers, you know, for... Uh, for quite a long time and uh, at the State Department, you know, sort of turned uh, using the State Department into an, uh, in, an engine for coup d'etats, you know, into an art form. And then, of course, he leaves the State Department, but essentially trains up most of the other subsequent secretaries of state, including people uh, like Hillary Clinton, for example, um, among others, of course, who would then go on and uh, do regime change. So, you know, he's a coup guy. You know, uh, and definitely very into real politique and all of these things and a, a war criminal and obviously doesn't um, care about the little people. I think one of his more infamous quotes is about, you know, calling U.S. soldiers like dumb beasts that are like pawns for the people that actually, uh, you know, decide what happens in the world. So uh, definitely an elitist worldview. And you also find that in this book. Um, and it's crazy. So, I mean, it basically... Um, there's all these different parts to it, I guess, but essentially their argument is something like AI is going to be so much smarter than us that it's going to be able to see aspects of reality that we can't see, but we should definitely trust that whatever it tells us is in this invisible hidden reality is totally reality and not just some AI hallucination, which is like an actual term, like that's a real phenomenon where AI presents something totally false and provably false as fact, right? So it can very easily be, you know, whatever this quote unquote reality is that AI is identifying uh, is, a de is delusional or just made up. It only exists in the mind, quote unquote, of the AI, right? So anyway, they're, they don't bring that up in their book at all. They just say, <clears throat> AI is going to allow us to uh, pursue this awesome quest for super knowledge and we're going to be able to see unseen realities. But there's a trade-off, they say. And the trade-off is that in order to unlock AI's full potential, we have to essentially sell off our ability to perceive reality reality and we have to use ai as we're use it you know as not just as we're using it using it now but deepen that involvement to the point where we're essentially uh dependent on ai to make decisions for us and we become cognitively diminished by ai meaning that um you know we aren't using our brains like we did before 
to make decisions and reason and perceive reality. And so AI, the machine, is doing all of that for us. That's sort of what they envision. And that's very dystopian. But then you read on and they start essentially talking about this two-tiered society model. So basically they're like, well, this AI quote unquote revolution will be very empowering for some people. You know, the policymakers, uh, the heads of multinational corporations, the people who design AI and, and code it and task it and regulate it, they'll find this very empowering. But then the people who, you know, consume AI from, you know, the consumer level um, or are just sort of, you know, not part of that other tier, everyone else really, uh, will be bewildered by its opaque decision making and, uh, you know, will be disempowered or find it disconcerting and won't really have any control over their lives anymore. And then over time, will cease to be able to realize what's happening to them. And uh, I mean, that's that's literally what the book is about. It's oh. very nuts and talks about, you know, AI is basically going to draw people, mainly this disempowered class, into a new version of reality that, that is essentially being designed by the empowered class right the technocrats i guess you could call them it's very like matrix-esque um and very creepy and a lot of it also has to do with what they say is going to be ai control over the information space and of course that's going to really come into its own once both ai and the internet are heavily regulated by a centralized authority which is what the un is gearing up to do next year what do you know what are they gearing up to like set the set the rules for all right here's how you interact with it because yes for ai for everyone globally a new un agency and it's backed by all the big ai companies like sam altman's yeah. open ai it's, among others it's completely um, disgusting one centralized authority to control all ai and um you know the goal is to have this ai uh, not just censor information like it's doing now on social media, for example, uh, they want it to basically write all of the all of the information. So basically, people will be, you know, on the new internet. You know, they'll be consuming information, but it'll all be written by AI. Essentially, that's yeah. like essentially what they want to do as they map it out. Have it like um, basically shape people's minds and make people uh, control how people receive reality by dominating the information space and all the information people have access to and like everything they see and do, hence the whole like push into augmented reality, Neuralink. I mean, that's like the final phase, I guess, of all of this. But, um, you know, it's to basically deepen our dependence on this stuff and have the algorithm continue to choose for us to a, a point where we don't even know how to choose for ourselves anymore. But again, that's for the plebs. There's this other class that's going to be cognitively enhanced and be making all the decisions and directing how, you know, AI develops and whatever. Have you so. been fo following the debate between closed source uh, AI and open source AI? No, not really. So the idea is that there's a battle within AI right now. Is if AI is here and it's going to be here, Moving forward, we're at a critical point in the history of artificial intelligence where we really need open source large language models and um, training models to outcompete the open AIs, Microsoft's, Google's of the world, and essentially give the plebs uh, the power of AI hosted on their own servers um, so that they can avoid the walled garden closed source structure provided by the open AIs of the world. It's very confusing because it's open AI, but it's closed source. Um, yeah, and then no, you I have know. this, you have like <laughs> Sam Altman and Google and Microsoft going in front of Congress a few months ago and basically saying, yes, please regulate us. Let us create this regulatory moat so that we are the gatekeepers of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Anytime the, the, private super powerful corporate world goes like regulate me harder daddy in front of congress you know there is fuckery afoot for sure um i mean basically what you have to keep in mind here and a lot of people forget this too silicon valley 
pretty much all of those main companies uh, were made by like intelligence services or the military or with funding from one or two, or if they weren't initially are now contractors and all intertwined with the national security state. So, okay. Um, I mean, that's why we have these things like people now getting upset about Facebook censoring stuff, but Facebook, you know, was essentially tied up with DARPA and, you know, the CIA through Peter Thiel uh, from, from the very beginning, right? So is it really that surprising that they would censor on behalf of the state? No, they're an independent private company. No, that's like a total, uh, that's a lie. Like the whole thing about Silicon Valley being all these like humble entrepreneurs tinkering around in their garage and look at what we've made with the American entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, that's such bullshit. Like if you look into any of these big companies, uh, you always had, you know, these powerful entities of the state there. And so they're extensions of state power. Even if you want to think that they weren't necessarily at the origins, you can't deny that now. I mean, they fused, essentially. That's why you have people like Eric Schmidt, which is why reading this book is really important. This is the most influential guy on AI policy in the U.S. right now. He's funding salaries of like all of the Biden administration's top AI people. It's totally illegal for him to do that, but he's doing it. And even like mainstream media, like Politico's reporting on it and nothing's happened. It's crazy. It's just, he's in charge. And he ran the National Security Commission on AI, uh, which basically laid out all of the policies. And that commission was the, the CIA uh, and people tied up with the CIA, like former heads of NQTEL that are very close friends of Schmidt, uh, military people that are also tied up with Schmidt because he used to be head of the, not the head, but used to be involved with the Defense Innovation Board. And uh, and then, you know, the big Silicon Valley companies, Amazon, Microsoft, um, all of those guys deciding what happens. I mean, they're really the same entity at this point because they're all either military intelligence contractors um, and you can't really decide where one ends and the other one ends. And you have all of these Silicon Valley billionaires, you know, they fund Congress essentially at this point or the DNC or the RNC. So, yeah. um, no. you know, the national security state Silicon Valley blob is what runs the U S and they're going to have their AI. And so they're really, I think what's going on now in terms of the battles of AI, well, I mean, sure there's this open source component, but there also is this competition over like which uh elite faction you know essentially you know there's this blob in the u.s and there's also like a, a BRICS blob i guess you know like in china for example of their tech companies you know who's going to get their ai adopted by uh, emerging markets in the global south and that's where a lot of the focus is is to do all this stuff you know in latin america africa um southeast asia um it's uh yeah, I don't know. Definitely something to uh, to look at there in terms of the dynamics because they talk pretty openly about it. But the justification that you know these groups uh, like Schmidt's group give for um, you know winning that factional battle is uh, in order to beat China, we have to become China and we have to compete with China's uh, what they call the China's civil military fusion model, which is you know. Um, civilian sector, the private sector and the military are fused in China. They're working together towards this goal. So, you know, the U.S. has to follow a develop a model equivalent to that, which is um, that is fascism. That is straight up fascism, guys. Um, and that is what Eric Schmidt, who is basically uh, one of the people puppeteering the Biden administration, because obviously Joe Biden is not in charge of shit. Um, you know, is that's what he wants to do now, with now the that, U.S. And that, mm -hmm. I was going to say, now that you mentioned, it, it's pretty hilarious because the effort that the government's putting in to put up a facade that there is some separation between the government and the private sector. It's like Kamala Harris is our AI czar. It's like what? Like, what the fuck does she know about AI? <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's nuts. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the AI czar is actually Eric Schmidt. They just won't tell you because he's funding all their experts and like developing all the policies with like his people. It's like he's like single handedly funding most of the Federation of American Scientists and stuff. I mean, it's just unreal. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, you have the Schmidt crowd and then you have the Peter Thiel crowd. Right. 
<clears throat> and the Peter Thiel crowd is very involved in the development of this um, AI weapon and AI surveillance technology. They've been testing a lot of it out in Ukraine and are going to be testing it out in the Middle East now for sure. Yeah, and I, I saw in your newsletter, <clears throat> wasn't you who wrote an article about it, but um, for, I can't recall her name, but it was diving into Andril. Uh, Stravula uh, Pabst, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Andril Palmer Lucky, who created Oculus, went and started this private defense company. And yeah. Well, Palmer Lucky was a Thiel fellow, right? So he got a bunch of money from Peter Thiel, and then he makes Oculus Rift, and then it gets bought by Facebook, where Peter Thiel has been sort of directing, at least in the early days, was very involved in directing stuff as their first big investor. And at the same time, he was making the CIA front, otherwise known as Palantir. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff happening there, obviously. And now uh, Palmer Lucky is uh, running Anderol, which is, um, you know, making a lot of this AI weapon stuff for the military, but also a lot of it has been already set up, that tech, on the U.S.-Mexico border to, like, basically autonomously, uh, you know, do border control stuff. And they're not stopping people from coming in, so it's very possible that it's mainly there to stop people from leaving at some point. Not to black pill people, but... Um, <laughs> oh. <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> no, but because it, it's funny, because I was at an event a few weeks ago, and Andrew was a point of topic, and the way it's being pitched is like, hey... If you're conservative, you don't like the big military budget, Andrew's going to be able to accomplish what the U.S. military can accomplish with 2% of the budget. And that's how people... Yeah, are autonomous drones it. that, um, you know, don't really have that much human oversight. And I mean, that the Ukrainian military is doing that now. I don't think it's necessarily with Andrew drones, even though Andrew drones are like used by the Ukrainian military, but they're like... Uh, all they've gotten rid of human oversight on some of their drone attacks now that is so bad i mean that's like skynet level crap um we should not be supporting that and i mean i don't know i think it's silly that there's like libertarian leaning people that fall for this because it's like aren't you empowering the state with like doom weapons like shouldn't you not um, but, it, but be it's into cheaper. That? i don't know it's cheaper we save tax money yeah that's well i mean pitched. I know. Well, they always have their pitch, right? It's cheaper. It's easier. It's more convenient. But what will you lose? Um, human I didn't think we, I didn't oversight think we had much... over war? Um, the AI deciding who lives and who dies? Um, okay. I, I, I don't like that trade-off, personally. And Not also, it. I mean, the wars, why, why aren't people remembering that the whole point is that uh, the wars are banker wars? Yeah. So like, oh, okay, the banker wars will be cheaper. What a win, you know? I don't really see that well, as being good. Why don't we uh, destroy the bankers and then their wars will stop? Well, that's, uh, I watched the 45-minute documentary on the banker wars after shit started popping up in Israel and Palestine. I forget if it was in that or I just <laughs> continued falling down a rabbit hole, but you mentioned it in the beginning of the show. We should probably get back to like the origins of Zionism was, you had, Mayor Rothschild, or one of the Rothschilds, at the beginning no, of the no, story. No, no, let's go back farther. <clears throat> so uh, again, uh, go to mintpressnews.com, search for my old article, the untold, uh, I think, untold story or untold history of Christian Zionism. It's one of the two. Um, so Christian Zionism, and really, Christian Zionism precedes Zionism. Zionism, yeah. So the founding father of Zionism. <coughs> Sorry, my cough keeps coming back. Um, the founding father of Zionism is Theodore Herzl, who wrote this book called The Jewish State. Um, I don't know. I was either the end of the 19th century or early 20th century. But the Puritans back in the 17th century in Britain and then later in the American colonies uh, were calling for um, a Jewish ethno state in Palestine back then as, an, as a necessary requisite to fulfill uh, end times prophecy so that basically we need to make this happen. So Jesus will come back. That was the, uh, mentality there. And then, you know, it didn't really get that far with the Puritans alone, but then you have this one guy come on the scene. who's a, a British, a preacher, uh, John Nelson Darby, I think is his name, if I remember correctly. Sorry. I mean, I wrote about this stuff a few years ago, so I don't 
may get a, a little weird on the names, but he basically developed, um, I think it's called uh, Christian dispensationalism, which sort of divides history into different eras. Like, so now we're in the messianic era and all of that. And he also developed uh, the rapture as a as a thing so you know the rapture is very common in american christianity but it didn't exist until the early 1800s no one believed in it before and it has no scriptural basis it doesn't there's no scriptural basis for the rapture in the bible there's nothing that says it anywhere just letting people know because there's a lot of people that are like in this messianic movement within christian zionism oh we have to all this Stuff has to be happen to be fulfilled because once it happens, you know, there'll be uh, the, the third temple when it's there will trigger the beginning of the tribulation and the rapture has to happen before the tribulation. So we won't be here and we won't have to suffer all this stuff that we helped create. Um, okay, but no one believed in the rapture until the 1800s and it was this one guy in his church that developed it. So uh, it's not in the Bible. So um, try not to make hell on earth, please. That's what I'm <laughs> trying to get at there. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so this guy became really influential and it kind of spread all over the place. And you basically had a, a, a couple different things happen um, in the 1800s. But one that's really important is that you start having like um, elite people in America and Britain uh, getting really involved with this idea of an ethno state. Uh, a Jewish ethno state in Palestine. And it was at the time completely rejected by the Jewish community globally, really not into it at all. And um, so you had, there's this one rabbi that was sort of into it. Uh, Kalisher is his last name. And he sort of developed this uh, movement, but it was very fringe at the time in Judaism that we can't wait for God to fulfill the messianic era. So we have to hasten the coming of the Jewish Messiah. Um, and this, this sort of torch has been picked up since by the Chabad Lubavitch movement, which is very, very influential by the way. Um, so for example, in the Trump administration, you have Mike Pence and you have Mike Pompeo, but Jared Kushner is very tied up with the Chabad Lubavitch movement. So is Netanyahu. So is Robert Maxwell and a lot of different powerful uh, actors over the years anyway getting ahead of myself sorry so um Kalisher wrote a letter in like 1830 something to one of the Rothschilds yeah and then the guy Charles Taze Russell that later creates this church that becomes the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, also writes to the Rothschilds asking for an ethno state in Palestine and uh there's a few of these letters that are written and then eventually you get the Balfour declaration in like 1917 but before then you get something called the Blackstone Memorial which is like at the end of the 1800s you have a letter from some of the most powerful people in the United States none of them Jewish really well there might have been a you know out of a hundred something signatories like a handful of Jewish people um calling, uh, it was written to the Secretary of State of the U.S. at the time, I forget who was president, um, but they're calling for the establishment of the state in Palestine. And this is all before Theodore Herzl, right, was even around. And the people that signed that Blackstone Memorial, it's J.P. Morgan, huh. J.D. Rockefeller, members of Congress, mayors of New York and Boston, uh, Supreme Court justices. I mean, like super powerful people, they're all, you know, wasps they're not jewish people right and they're saying we need this to happen and then if you look into the history of theodore herzl himself his whole movement was shaped by a british guy who i think was uh stationed at uh the british embassy in austria william heckler who was like a total i mean he's a, a freemason totally obsessed with the third temple had like replica of the third temple in, in his office was just totally obsessed with it um, and felt like the ethno state and Jewish ethno state in Palestine had to happen for the end times. He's the guy that like gets uh, sort of mentors Herzl in some ways, connects him with powerful political people, specifically like in Germany and in that part of Europe and like basically gives his movement, the early Zionist movement, political legitimacy, which of course later develops. And then you have powerful people um, in countries around the world, Europe, and also the US, people like Louis Brandeis, for example, who are Jewish, who become very involved in 
the Zionist movement, but it took a while for people who were actually Jewish to want the ethno state in Palestine. And you don't really have mass support for it in the Jewish community until after World War II. So there's a lot of powerful actors that wanted this to happen for very particular reasons uh, a long, long time ago, and not necessarily because they think it's best for the Jewish community. So again, definitely go and read that article because I mean, I'm just paraphrasing it and I wrote it four years ago, you know, but this history is really important because you have a lot of people who still feel that way guiding current events. And it's not for the benefit of Jewish people or for the Palestinians or for Christians or any of these people, you know, it's an obsession with the apocalypse and people really need to look into this because, um, I personally don't want to have, uh, the apocalypse happen and blow up everything because people think it's going to, uh, bring their Messiah back. Well, yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a self-fulfilling um, prophecy with uh, no good outcome. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like, this whole thing of like, let's play God. I mean, you see it with transhumanism too. Let's become the gods now. And then these other people in this arena are like, well, let's not wait for God to do it. Let's take matters into our own hands and force him to do stuff. It doesn't work that way, guys. Yeah. I'm just envisioning the domino meme where it's like some dude invents the idea of the rapture in the 17th century. And then the big domino is like nuclear Holocaust in 2024 or something like that. Well, it's like sad because there are like so many people that are like, it doesn't matter all the bloodshed in Israel and Palestine and what happens as a consequence of it in world war three. Let's support all of that because I'm going to get raptured out of here. Dude, it's not in the Bible. This one guy made it up. And if you look into him, he was like, not a normal dude. Yeah. And um, I guess one figure I didn't really bring up in terms of the Christian Zionism thing was the guy that really popularized that outside, like um, among the masses. So before this view, right, you know, J.D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, it was like very among the American elites. And there's also a lot of overlap with Freemasonry. So Charles Taze Russell who I mentioned earlier, the guy that, you know, helped create the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, look up where he's buried and what his tombstone looks like. Just leave it there. Um, definitely an interesting fellow who uh, happens to be buried under a giant Masonic pyramid. Wait, what was his name? Whatever. James Russell? Um, Charles, uh, Charles Char- Taze Russell, T-A-Z-E. Charles Taze Russell. Look up the, the tomb. Logan, we're going to pull this Yeah, up. he would give like these big speeches to Christians and Jews alike saying, we got to make a Jewish ethno state in Palestine, like in at the end of the 19th century and stuff. I mean, people overlook this stuff, but I mean, these are definitely influential people. But anyway, the guy I didn't mention who's really influential is a guy named Cyrus Schofield, who wrote the Schofield Reference Bible. And if you look at into, yeah, there it is. I mean, totally normal dude wants to be buried under that, you know? (laughs) Um. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Whatever. Yeah. Sorry Sorry. for interrupting. Um, No, 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 not interrupting at all. Um, Yeah, so the the Schofield Reference Bible guy, basically Cyrus Schofield uh, had to leave where he was originally from because of corruption scandals and like he abandoned his wife and daughters and was a drunk and was basically an all around piece of shit. And eventually he gets involved with some like elite people, even though he's like sort of tried to revive himself as a um, a, a different kind of, uh, I guess, preacher getting into this Christian dispensationalist movement that I talked about earlier. And then he, uh, you know, out of nowhere, this like small town preacher gets invited to join this like really exclusive uh, secret society in New York called the Lotus Club. And uh, where like Andrew Carnegie and the Vanderbilts and all these guys were members. So like, what is he doing there? And uh, that club ended up financing him to write what is called the Schofield Reference Bible and then arranged for him to go to uh, England where he uh, got the first... um, reference Bible uh, printed in, by Oxford University. And then thanks to all these elite connections, it was basically became like the main Bible used in seminaries throughout the United States. And I, I think also in the UK. And this is important because so the sky, the, the, this Bible 
is a, it's the King James version, but it's like annotated by Cyrus Schofield, even though he wasn't a trained theologian and had started off like, you know, having all these uh, issues with like forging documents and bribing people. And like, yeah. So anyway, that's his background. But he's so he's interpreting all this stuff. And it basically became the standard for a lot of um, yeah, uh, seminaries in, in the US. And that's how it sort of got out. And so a lot of uh, interpretations of the Bible come from that that are, you know, uh, things like that you hear from a lot of Christian Zionists, like if you curse Israel, you will be cursed. And if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed, which by these groups becomes something like, if you criticize Israel, you're cursing Israel. And so you're going against the Bible by saying anything negative about Israel's government. Right? And it goes back to that. And it mm -hmm. comes from the Schofield reference Bible. Very weird I, I don't know it's definitely worth looking into cyrus schofield and, and who he was um because you know whether you're a christian or not i think honestly this history matters and i think especially if you're a christian it matters um because you know you should be concerned with uh you know the lack of you know, how should i phrase this like um the focus of christianity in my opinion should be you know as close to the truth as jesus taught it Right. Not necessarily mm -hmm. like people like John Nelson Darby and all these guys in the 1800s and Cyrus Schofield adding their interpretations to it. Like maybe you should go back earlier before like all these centuries of like uh, corrupt Catholic popes and then, you know, corrupt people like Cyrus Schofield started interpreting stuff for, you know, their political benefit, you know. So, yeah. I mean, it's definitely worth considering some of this stuff. You know what I mean? So again, um, if you want to know how the Middle East is going to play out, or at least rather where they're going to try and take this, definitely look into the stuff because uh, it's been going on for a long time and it definitely precedes Theodore Herzl and all of that stuff to a significant, significant degree. And this same line of thinking is still influencing events today. Lineage of radical Christians trying to bring about the rapture is why we're... It's not just Christians, though. Yeah. yeah. It's like there's people in Israel and people in the U.S. and arguably beyond. I mean, I'm not, you know, I haven't, like, in, uh, studied Islam that extensively. Like, so a lot of this line of research at Mint Press happened because I, like, majored in religion in college. So I had a lot of background but I never really have studied Islam, but I know there's like messianic varieties of Islam as well. So it's very possible that like on their side, they also sort of want to bring out their Messiah too. I mean, it's more than possible. You know, you have all these different groups pushing for their different end time scenarios that they think are going to favor them in some way. Um, but again, to go back to this quote from, from Gareth Ike that I sort of said earlier, let's get off the chessboard, stop playing these guys' uh, game because it's very bloody and it's very nasty. It's very um, against human freedom and the values that I think most, you know, sane people share. Right. Yeah. yeah no, and it's, I mean, going back to like the Bible, like an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. I'm not sure if that's the Bible or. Yeah. I think well, I mean, that's sort of essentially happening now uh, in terms of justifying, you know, what's going on with, Israel and Palestine and like the increasing escalations. Right. Yeah. So no, it's, it's been crazy know. to see just like the, the vitriol spreading. Like we have protests here in the U S the Capitol building yesterday, embassies around the world. Everybody is out looking for blood. And like you said, <laughs> I don't know how we can do it, but it definitely needs to happen. It's like, Hey people, everybody walk off the chessboard. You're being manipulated. Going back to well, you may not be able to convince other people to walk off the chessboard, but definitely don't feed in to like the extreme. Let's get all divided in anger, hate, and anyone that doesn't believe what I believe is a terrorist mentality. Like that is so not helpful. Um, and it's you know it's it was totally what was not helpful about COVID too. You know, you know, and it is helpful to like you didn't get the vax. You're a biosecurity threat to me yeah. and my family and my grandma. You know, I mean, and now it's becoming clear same, that uh, same deal. that uh, what was promised that this wasn't gene therapy is it's becoming clear that there was a lot of 
DNA that was not supposed to be in those Uh-oh. vials. In those vials. Um, well, this is what happens when you trust the craziest people at DARPA in the military to make a vaccine for you without any sort of safety re- studies of any meaning and oversight. Hey, they and jabbed, call it Operation Warp Speed. They jabbed a dozen mice. It looked good. It looked good in the mice. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think how long how many days did they like follow up on the mice too? I feel like it was like not long. No. You know? Sort of like those Monsanto roundup studies where they like knew that the mice were all gonna get tumors after like three months, and so they made sure the study only lasted two months. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it's and it is but trust the science. Well, trust the science and then like, just, you know, because it's not like science can be manipulated by the people who manipulate literally everything. I mean, in the whole it's hilarious going back to the lack of critical thinking that exists in the world and the attempt to diminish that even further with AI. It's like science is literally that, don't trust anything like test, test, test. <laughs> it's like no, literally just, AI is being set up to be like the mother of all psyops it's like use ai to like put out a bunch of content pretend it's people like just give people crazy information overload so they're totally bewildered and then depend on another ai to filter out the news for you and tell you what you should believe they literally say that in the book and that's like what's happening (laughs) it's nuts that's where i mean things like noster that's what I think it's going to have to get to is literally when you send a message out on the internet and I don't, this is a problem that still hasn't been solved yet, but you should have something equivalent to a Yubi key that has a private key on it and that you sign and attest to the message. Like this actually came from me, the physical human being. Um, and if I don't have this PGP signature or this private key signed next to anything I put on the internet, it's not me. It's likely a bot. Well, it's definitely going to be superior to former Twitter, which is, um, you know, X. verify all humans. Um, well, they just came know, out with their new privacy so policy. That whole like, let's in. They just came out with the privacy policy where they're going to feed all the information into their AI. I'm like, oh, except. Oh, doesn't Elon Musk back open AI? I'm so shocked. Well, apparently he backed away from Oh, no, that. but he has another AI company that he's made, too. That's going to be all tied into the X super family of companies. Yeah. And I mean, if you, I'm sure you've been paying attention, but you can see the light nudging that's happening on X uh, to really cattle herd people to, like, never leave the platform. Like, the one change they made two weeks ago, which is, like, if you have a link going outside of the site, it's just, like, a picture. It doesn't even have, like, an article. Mm-hmm. Uh, subtitle, subtitle and metadata. It's it's only going to get worse. Yeah. It's only going to get worse. And there's a lot of people who like w- just can't live without social media. So like they'll just stay forever and get psyoped into oblivion by AI. Uh oh. Yeah. Um, Have you? What are your thoughts on Nostra? Yeah. I know you're on there. Um, we talked about it so, briefly. So yeah, the I've I've been kind of tied up for like three or four months, so I haven't really gotten to like use it or really Twitter much. Um, I'm kind of avoiding it because it um, not not Noster necessarily, um, but like Twitter, just because I, blah, you know. I mean, just social media in general can be just kind of exhausting, and obviously the algorithm is. Well, for people that don't remember, like Facebook and some of these other companies got caught like tweaking their algorithm to like manipulate your emotions, Mm -hmm. mainly to make you feel like shit, basically. So I'm pretty sure they still do that, Uh, whether it's Twitter or elsewhere. Twitter, I had to I had to stop looking at Twitter as much because the for you tab for me is literally all murder videos. I'm like, I don't want to watch murder. Yeah, a lot of it is like, yeah, so I didn't, wasn't enjoying it either and was like, nah, I don't need this. And so, you know, if I want to tweet something, I'll like, you know, it'll, it'll be tweeted, but I'm not reading anything on it anymore. Yeah. Because, all right, so, you know, after reading this book by Kissinger and Schmidt, basically, who were basically the intellectual architects of current U.S. AI policy, and when you consider that, like, the U.S. military literally... Uh, like almost 10 years ago, started studying how to use social media to, their words, control humans like drones, okay? (laughs) Um, Definitely want to keep your perception of reality yours, 
You know what I mean? If, if the goal of AI for them is to have AI control how you perceive reality and that you stop being able to do that yourself, I mean, that's like the ultimate mind control and population control. That's what this is about. And they openly say in the book, this has major implications for free societies and even free will. Okay. And it's pretty clear what they want out of this. So the best way to, uh, you know, fight against that, at least on an individual level, is to keep your mind your own. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that means having very robust critical thinking skills and not having political saviors that you just believe whatever they say and also talk, not being online 100% of the time. Yeah. Do you have any hope that everything they're attempting to do from the CBDC to AI to this tearing down and rebuilding of the temple, it's just too much for them to, to control and contain at this point and that they're yeah. going to lose control yeah. that people are going to recognize like, all right, totally. what the hell just happened? Cause it seems like it's over. It's becoming extremely yeah. overwhelming to an extent. Too many moving parts and they can't manage it all, which I think is part of why they're so desperate to get AI to a certain point too, because they have to have AI manage a lot of it. Okay. But this is where freedom tech people need to get creative because it's not enough just to develop stuff where you're like, okay, um, I want to make alternatives to existing big tech products. Like how do you not only divest from big tech AI products, how do you uh, help fuck up big tech AI products? You know? Make them hallucinate faster. Like how can you uh, feed Microsoft's AI a bunch of bullshit data that is basically like throwing a wrench in its algorithm? Yeah. For example. Right. Hmm. I mean, you know, this is an info war, but it's like it's a tech war. There's a lot going on. And so, like, maybe we're the underdogs. But at the same time, these guys have taken on a lot more than they can chew. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And I think they're, you know, very confident they're going to be able to control stuff and AI is going to be able to do this and that. But. Okay, so just like every industry that like these guys control, there's a lot of corruption. Like a lot of AI companies oversell their AI and their out their algorithms, you know? So like I wrote about one in 2020 with COVID. This Israeli company uh, got this contract in Rhode Island to like predict COVID outbreaks before they happen. Yeah. And based on the company, and this is like not audited by anyone independent this is like the company statistic they said that their ai was like 73 percent accurate <laughs> right so if it's audited independently and it's like 50 percent, it's like flipping a coin how yeah. is that useful right so like there's a lot of grift just like all the industries that these guys i mean because it's all about money and power right it, they often create inferior products because of the obsession with money and power so like there's problems with their AI, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I, I do think at some point though, based on what is in this Kissinger book, uh, they're probably going to try and fake artificial, like general artificial intelligence or whatever, like the singularity, they might fake that and try and make this new like AI driven religion and stuff. And the dataism religion thing that like you all know a Harari is really into. I mean, they might try and go that route, but I doubt it will be. I mean, it won't be real. I mean, you, it'll just be a psyop. I Sam think. Altman's come out and said that they yeah. discovered AGI internally in OpenAI already. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's that's amazing. Okay, so well, amazing in the sense that like it's hilarious and he's full of shit. <laughs> Logan, see if you can find that on um, Twitter. There's, so. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. So I did a video with my friend Ryan Christian a while ago when Google covertly tried to do the same thing with their uh, large language model, Lambda. I don't know if you remember, there was an engineer that got coverage in like the Wall Street Journal yeah. and the New York Times being like, it's sentient, guys. And he had like these chat logs and then a few months later had to admit that he like forged the chat logs and it was like all bullshit. But there was this huge like, media push like ai is sentient the singularity is here and all these people got like jacked up on it you know yeah um but there's like a whole uh, effort i think to basically you know do um 
you know, just fake it, basically. Because once you have people being like, oh, there's this new great intelligence, um, a lot of the stuff that's posited in the Schmidt Kissinger book becomes a lot easier to implement, you know? Yeah, yeah, I found a tweet. <laughs> and so it doesn't have to be real. No. So, like, here, here pull this up, Logan. Um, apparently it was Sam Altman in a, in a Reddit thread basically saying AGI has been achieved internally. There is a community note on this yeah. tweet saying that he responded saying, I was just joking. Um, right, okay. Well, okay, you know, just like I think it's a good rule to, like, never trust the Fed or Jamie Dimon. I also don't think it's a good uh, idea to ever trust the world coin dweeb. So, <laughs> like, he's probably full of shit. Yeah. Sorry. He's like literally running a scam, stealing people's biometric data and sell it and giving them shit coins in return. Like, have you seen the probably allegations? wouldn't believe the guy. He's like a clear grifter. And Sorry. have you seen the allegations from his sister? Oh, no. More more stuff to look up. Look at me. <laughs> uh, allegations. I don't want to get in trouble for slander or anything. But no, apparently his sister has been on Twitter for a year saying that he molested her. <laughs> When he was, when they were younger. Oh no, I did not know that. Yeah, but um, it's being swept under the rug pretty aggressively. Oh, gross. Yeah. Well, he's gross. Um, I can't say it really shocks me that there's a high possibility he might be grosser than I previously thought. I guess. Um, yeah, but basically, you know, I think they're going to fake this, um, singularity thing to sort of get people to jump on the AI bandwagon and be like, okay, let's put it in charge of everything. Um, because that's what they want. But frankly, it's like, you know, like I said earlier, I don't think it's really working the way they want. And ultimately, you know, if they get the singularity or they, they convince people they get it, they can do like this whole like Wizard of Oz thing. Right. We're mm -hmm. basically like they're the men behind the curtain and there's this AI and like AI issues all these like edicts and diktats and like, oh, well, AI is super intelligent and way smarter than us. So we got to do whatever the AI says, guys, you know, but I mean, it could just be like Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt behind the curtain being like, let's carpet bomb Iran, yeah. you know, and you, you should uh, only the have AI one kid. says it and. Yeah, yeah, eat the bugs, whatever. Like, AI says it all. It's for the good. It's the super intelligence. Uh, so we just got to do whatever it says. And, you know, they say in their book, too, and a lot of other, like, AI experts and, and thinkers, you know, AI doesn't have logic or, you know, think, quote unquote, like humans do. So it can't explain how it reaches its conclusions, you know? So yeah, well, it's all this opaque decision making. Computer says no, and that's it, right? But they don't have to have actual singularity, actual intelligence. They just fake it and act like AI is doing all that stuff, but it's really just them being like, oh, cool, now we have carte blanche to do whatever the F we want, you know, and have no accountability or ever have to explain ourselves again. If you're yeah. the elite, would you want that? Oh, yes. Would you fake the singularity to get that? Uh, yes, especially if you know you can't achieve the singularity because you're overestimating AI and overhyping it all the time. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's like... I mean, AI can do some stuff good, but yeah, it well, can't that, do everything they say it can do. No, and that's why it's conflicting t to me and why I brought up the open source versus closed source battle that's going on right now to you because I get value particularly for image generation for the website, for thumbnails, it does produce pretty cool images. And there are um, stable diffusion models, open source models that I can run on my own server and sort of train it uh, with our brand aesthetic to like pump out thumbnails very easily. And for me, I don't have the money to hire a designer and to do that or the time to mm -hmm. do that. And so like that provides value to me. And I could see a scenario in which mm -hmm. I have my own hosted AI model on my own computer that I control that doesn't connect to the outside world. And I just feed it data and say, Hey, help me sort of crunch these numbers and give me back a income statement balance sheet, um, uh, with the financials that sit on my server. Like, and do that quickly. Like that could be valuable to me and other things. Sure. Too. Like, well, I'm not saying AI is bad. I'm saying the worst people in the world 
are making a bunch of AIs right now and they want to put the AIs they make in charge of everything. Yes. That's bad. That is terrible. Precisely because they're the worst people in the world. Right. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, that's like my main point here. Like, I'm not trying to be like a Luddite or saying like, don't use technology, whatever, but you have to be responsible and you have to be very like aware of the plans of these people and how they, they plan to use those technologies and also how they plan to regulate them. And if they plan to make your ability to, you know, do what you just mentioned with AI illegal, right? Yeah. Because they want to make financial anonymity illegal. They want to keep uh, control of all of these tools uh, in the technology and centralize it, right? So, I mean, they might try and go that route. I mean, I don't really know. Oh, but they're, they're um, definitely going I mean, to. I mean, that's why Sam Altman's in front of Congress. That's why the Google people are in front of Congress that, that, I mean, it's so crazy how, and that's why I think your statement is that they're really rushing this because they think they're losing control holds a lot of weight in my mind. It's because yeah. like yeah. the fact that AI became popular this time last year, and then not even a year later, less than 10 months later, you have all the heads of AI on Congress being like, regulate me harder, daddy. Don't let anybody else use this. Yeah. Like, it's a very yeah, yeah, accelerated yeah, yeah. pace. Exactly. It went from nothing to an existential crisis in seven months. Yeah. And it's going to, I'm telling you, next year is going to be even faster than this year. It's going to be nuts. There's going to be a lot of stuff popping off. Yeah. So we're going to have the great election. Definitely time to get ready. The great election to distract all of us and divide and confuse people in the middle of all of it. Um, If you want to take what's coming seriously, Treat what's happening with the election as the political circus that it is and give it the amount of your attention it deserves, which is not much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, People, I think, should honestly be focusing on, like, how to divest from the people trying to enslave us and get prepared for what's to come. Yeah. No, I mean, even this week. And not being like. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say just even this week, I don't want to call what's happening. I don't want to diminish what's happening in the Middle East and labeled as a distraction, but like here in the U S like the financial system, something broke on the back end of the financial system. It's very obvious. If you look at like interest rates and price of gold. And then on top of that, uh, on the civil liberty side of things, they just jailed that guy, uh, James Mackey, I believe his name is Douglas Mackey, uh, for seven months for making a meme about Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. Right. And Mm -hmm. so like you have like political dissonance getting thrown in the gulag, obviously all the January 6th people have been thrown in the gulag. Here's the other thing I forgot to bring up about WEFPAC, um, which is involved with the UN and Interpol too, because Interpol is a big part of it. And that's important because it's not just about online and financial anonymity, like eliminating that. It's also about labeling people that go against that ban as cyber criminals. And you can also be a cyber criminal for publishing misinformation online, right? And there's this push at the UN under SDG 16, which is also the SDG that digital ID is folded in and all this other stuff is, um, to basically um, you know, prosecute cyber criminals globally and have Interpol go after people, like empower Interpol poll to do that, which is part of WEFPAC and the DOJ for people in the US, also part of it. All very bad, right? So anyway, Interpol developed its sustainable policing goals. I mean, I wish I was making this up, Um, but it's to complement the sustainable development goals. And it's about deciding who's a cyber criminal and who's not. And basically, Again, people that publish wrong think online, uh, people that uh, facilitate um, you know, privacy enhancing technologies that could be used for money laundering, you know, yeah. well, all that stuff. And I mean, that- they've already been doing this in like the crypto space for a while, like anyone like going after people that, you know, developed mixers and stuff like this. Or, yeah. But this week know. too, they tried to like pin Bitcoin as supporting Hamas and like the best evidence they had, they were like, this one wallet got yes. $2,000. It's like, what? <laughs> like, they rolled in with the guns you gave Ukraine. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, no, I know. So, like, before this happened, this conflict happened. I gave this speech in May at mm-hmm. at the in Miami, right? And I was like referencing all these headlines, saying that the next frontier in terrorism is Bitcoin and the dark web. 
it was all, it's been all over the place for years. They're going to come after it. And it's not like, it's just like, um, oh, they're going to illegalize Bitcoin or anything. I think they're going to try and co-opt what they can out of Bitcoin and then try and negate the potential Bitcoin has to be a tool for financial freedom, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I completely agree with you. It is our job as people fighting to bring freedom tech to the world. Bitcoin being yeah. one of those technologies that we have to get serious. So and like batten down yeah. the hatches. So for like the Bitcoin, I'm oh, sorry. So for like the Bitcoin community, there's like really two camps as I see it. There's the people that are like, I'm into Bitcoin because I think it's going to make me shitloads of money and I can't wait for million dollar Bitcoin and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And then there's the people who were like, I'm in Bitcoin because I want to uh, destroy the bankers and their hold on society and return financial freedom to the people. There is only one side there that's legitimate. Yeah. And there's only one side there that is like deserving of respect. And the other people might as well go work for Jamie Dimon and fuck off. Yeah. Well, that is, um, that is one of the memes in Bitcoin is you come to get rich, but you stay for the revolution. So I do, I do agree those two sides exist, but yeah. I think the more people spend. Well, I mean, you can look at it as a money thing, but if you give no crap about the financial freedom side and you're willing to collaborate to turn Bitcoin into a tool for the same people it was supposedly created to, you know, fight against. Uh, I don't respect you. Yeah. You suck. That's yeah. how I feel about it. That's why, uh, <laughs> we've really been beating the drum. Like don't buy the ETF. The ETF is, uh, the whole BlackRock ETF. The fact that BlackRock was like calling Bitcoin like terrible. It was like anti ESG. And then you have this complete about face like, Oh, we love Bitcoin. We're going to get the largest ETF. I think they can use it to benefit them. As things move forward, yeah. And there's a fight to be had for the control of Bitcoin, for sure. Um, do you want the Larry Finks to win? I don't. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's pretty clear, um, at least, you know, people that believe in, like, financial freedom, like, what side to choose, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Because if the people that care about financial freedom just sit back and don't do anything to keep Bitcoin as a, you know, as potentially helping that, uh, it will be lost and it will be hollowed out and turned into a zombie that serves the, the same powers that be yeah. that are fucking everything up. Let's not do that guys. Completely agree. Again, anyway, I've, I've got to go. Cause I've okay. got uh, a hungry baby who's upset. So <laughs> well, you go feed your baby. Uh, probably have um, another minute or two. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming back on the show. There's a lot of stuff popping off. I'm sure yeah, we'll absolutely. talk. We'll talk uh, sooner rather than later because things are, I don't think, going to de decelerate from here. Um, but no, I'm happy no. to see you. <laughs> I'm happy to see you back in the saddle. I know it was a, a tough winter for you. and um, Yeah. yeah. So now I was thinking about you a lot in the last few months. and um, Well, thanks, Marty. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to be back and talking about stuff and not just, you know, being a mom 24 seven, but it is my first and most important job. So, yes. you know, got to do what you got to do. Yes. Yeah. So Kids uh, always come first. And hopefully we'll be back to work kind of normally with a better internet connection next <laughs> month. I'd like that very much. Uh, um, but it's kind of slow going because my son, since we got out, has been in and out of the hospital. We have to go back uh, on Sunday for a few days. Hopefully that'll be the last of it for a while and I can kind of work again. That'd yeah. be nice. Well, uh, I'll be praying for you guys and, uh, <coughs> thank you. Keep crushing it. Keep sticking the needle in the eyes of, of these despots who want to, uh, yeah, it's what I live for, I guess <laughs> that and, and, uh, the people I care about, you know? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, we're going to win a lot of black pills, a lot of history, but there are some white pills too. Well, it's a. I guess it's a black pill in the sense if you feel like you have like no agency over events. And I don't really think that's true. No. Walk like off the I think the board. people that invest in preparing and divesting and taking responsibility for themselves will be pretty well off when things, um, you know, hit the fan, so to speak. I mean, it's going to be crazy, but you just got to be in the right mindset for it. 
and you got to be practical about how to prepare. Yeah. And also if you're out there, cause I know a lot of you are out there, you email me. There's a lot of people in prominent positions who believe the same things we do, but feel that they can't speak up. They self-censor, um, speak up. That's what we need more of too. Well, people just need to stop being afraid about it. Like the stakes are very high. And I mean, if you're like afraid about it all the time, it's, it's, I mean, I'll to paraphrase Dune, you know, fear is the mind killer. It's very true. And um, from people that have survived economic collapse, like in Argentina, for example, I live in South America, so I know people from Argentina that had to live through that. Uh, they all say your state of mental preparedness is like the most important because if you're panicking and freaking out and you don't think clearly, you make bad decisions. Yeah. Mentally prepare. We'll end it there. Whitney, mm -hmm. it's always a pleasure. Likewise, Marty. Thanks. Peace and love, freaks. 